I am Andrus Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom. Today, we'll be learning from John Harland about uh, gradient, curl, and divergence. I want to share with you the intuition that I gain after I made the, all this video. So gradient, curl, divergence are three operators, and we need to be mindful of what is their inputs and what is their outputs. So the gradient is taking a scalar field, which could be, for example, temperature in space. Every point has some numeric value. And it outputs a vector field, which would be, let's say, the direction of the warmth. So our body knows uh, when you light a fire, it immediately senses that there's a direction that's warm, even though temperature hasn't even actually changed. So that's the gradient is yielding uh, from just this numerical information. It's yielding a direction. Then a vector field has at every point some direction. These are continuous vector fields, so they're changing continuously. And what a curl does is a curl takes one vector field and outputs another vector field. And so what's happening at every single point, there's a vector and it'll give you a new vector, okay? And then finally, divergence is taking a vector field and it is outputting a scalar field. So it's sizing up all the possible directions. Let's say you're at a particular point. What are the directions that you could be going in, let's say? And it uh, sums them all up with some kind of number, okay? That indicates. So they have these different um, characters. And so you start with a scalar field, you go to a vector field, then the curl can take you to another vector field, then the divergence can give you a scalar field. Now, the crucial thing that they share, which makes this a fantastic system for physical intuition, they're all measuring change in direction. And this, I, took, I worked on this video many times, you know, going, listening over and over till I finally, you know, in reading Wikipedia, I finally figured it out. So that's what I wanted to tell you at the very beginning. The gradient is looking at the change in all directions. Okay. So, it's going to sum up all those possible temperatures, let's say, and it's going to calculate like what is the direction. It'll look in the direction. It'll make a calculation based on what's happening in the X axis, uh, in the Y direction, in the Z direction, but it's going to find the direction that's the maximum direction in terms of the change. Now the curl, once you have this world of vectors that are swirling around, it's kind of like being in water, let's say. The curl ignores your own direction. So let's say you have a, you're at a point, your point knows what the vector direction is for that point. The curl says, we're not interested, right? We're interested in all the things that are around, okay? And we're gonna pay attention. So that means that we're not interested what's happening in our direction, but we're interesting, like if we move over parallel, will this, get smaller, the vector, or will the vector get larger, you see? And then if it's getting larger on one side and smaller on the other side, that's going to make us kind of favor the larger side, let's say, so we may be turning accordingly, okay? Like it's, however, it's pushing us, like a paddle wheel in water. But it's not interested in the direction it's going, it's interesting in the direction, the other directions possible, how you could be uh, leaning one way or the other. And then finally, the divergence, that's the one that's interested in your own direction. Like, you know where you have to go, but would you like to go slower or would you like to go faster, right? Well, that arrow, that thing is changing. It's jerking you around. It's accelerating or decelerating you in that direction. It doesn't care what's going on in the other directions, okay? And so it's a beautiful philosophical way for splitting these things up. That's what we're looking for. Math for wisdom is where are these cognitive things uh, revealing themselves in physics. So still a mystery. Just let's go through some examples. Um, here's the gradient. You have a scalar field. So imagine um, in the XY plane, you know, you have, let's say, temperature. All the temperature is constant. 
But as you rise up in the Z plane, okay, it gets, let's say, warmer. And let's say this is happening at a constant rate, okay, that kind of depends on how high you are. That's how the temperature goes. So that's the scalar field will be f of x comma y comma z, but it's not paying attention to the x and y variables. It's only paying attention to the z to say it's getting hotter, 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 or, you know, you go down, it gets colder, 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 okay? So the gradient will be that up direction. Okay, away from the down and towards the up, away from the cold and towards the warmth. And so when you calculate it out, it'll be this uh, vector k. You know, so i, j, k are the vector directions uh, for x, y, z axes. So that's what I can tell you about the gradient. Now, how about the curl? Okay, so the curl is more sophisticated. This is really tricky, and we work on this. But basically, so for the curl, it, you have to pay attention what's happening parallel, okay? And so all three possible axes come into play. So let's look at this vector field. And remember, every point has a vector coming out of it, right? So this is a vector field. And this one uh, is called the vector field G of X, Y, Z. Those are the describing the point that you're looking at. And it's going to say this field will be have value X, but the vector will point uh, in the J direction, which is the Y direction, okay? So you have this curious uh, relationship where a little bit of X, a little bit of Y, right? So X is telling you the amount, the size, and Y is saying, you know, this is the J direction, okay? I own you in this direction. So what does that mean? That means that all of these um, arrows are pointing in the J direction, in the Y axis, if you look at them, right? Some are big and some are small, but they're all pointing in the same direction. Of course, some are pointing in the opposite direction. That's the negative number, you know, for the, but they're really pointing in the same direction. We just have positive or negative numbers. But now if you look at the size, you see the size is given by your position on the X axis. So you can imagine if this is X is zero where my arrow is, uh, then um, where my um, mouse uh, is, <laughs> arrows, well, see, that would be zero. So then that'd be, you just imagine it's just zero there. Nothing is flowing. But if you go off to the side a bit, like the arrow gets, and you actually see, this would be the X equals Y line. So as you go over, the arrows become bigger. So as X moves over, the arrows become bigger. So the arrows are given by the, the size of the arrows is given by this X, but they're all pointing in the Y axis, okay? So I drew I had to draw lots of little arrows here just to show you know what's going on because this is happening all over the plane, right? And this is in the XY plane. The idea is that Z is not affected here. So it just kind of as you go up, you just get the same image. Uh, it's not changing in that direction. okay. So we're looking at any point. Uh, they've kind of linked together um, the X and the Y. And that's uh, you should think about rotations because that's what rotations do. They link together two axes in a funky kind of way like that. So what is the curl doing? We want to get, we have vectors. We want to get new vectors with, uh, they kind of give us a new take on this, right? And so the curl is going to try to indicate um, how are things changing in the perpendicular direction? Well, our vectors, let's say, are pointing one way, but if we move over, you know, perpendicularly, are they getting smaller? Are they getting bigger? Okay. So if we move over perpendicularly, I mean, you can look in the Z direction, they're just staying the same. But let's say if you look at the uh, X direction here, uh, they're getting bigger, okay, or more positive. Here they're getting smaller, then they'll get smaller, they'll become negative, and they'll become even smaller, you know, which is actually bigger in the negative direction. Okay. So what happens if the water's pushing like that, right? Well, the water uh, is going to, uh, if you have a paddle, it'll turn you uh, counterclockwise against the clock, right? You'll go like that. And so with you, with the right hand rule, I have to turn my right hand around. So it'd be my, you know, but you know how to do that. You, you, let's see, I would have to do it like that, right? Okay, somehow I'd have to use my left hand, figure it out. But what you do is you you curl around and you your your thumb should show you if you do it you'll get it right you know you, sh you show you like that oh the thumb is pointing out of the plane okay in the z direction it's the like vector k okay that's how the paddle wheel will turn and notice that um, if 
the, this is constant. You know, if you do the formula for the calculation, uh, that's a separate issue. But the, the answer that to understand in this case, because x is linear, and when we take the derivative of x, we'll get 1, right? And then we end up with this 1 times k vector. What it basically means, it means that the curl is constant everywhere. Okay, so that vector, which is coming out of the plane because the rotation is in the plane, it's coming out of the plane, but it has a constant value. And intuitively, why is that? Well, because it's not the size of the vectors that matters, but it's the difference between what's happening on, let's say, your right and your left, right? And that difference is, uh, it's it's linear, so it's increasing. Size. So you can have a big arrow here, and you can have a small arrow there, or you could have a little arrow here, and then a little arrow in the opposite direction, or you could have a small arrow here and a big arrow, but the difference is the same everywhere. So the curl will be the same, okay? So we put a vector in, we got a vector out, but you see all three dimensions are coming into play here. You had the X is giving you the change. Uh, the, the J, which is the Y direction, is telling you how you're originally pointing. And then the K, which was the dimension left out, it's going to be the new output. You see how it's beautiful. And this, this is very special about three dimensions. And now, um, now if we want to have a vector field, we want to kind of collapse it back to a scalar field, like encode that information. And now we just focus on our own direction. Okay. So again, we're looking at a very simple case, which would be, let's say, the vector field uh, where you have, uh, it's changing like X, but this time, um, the arrow is going to point in the uh, x-axis direction, which is the vector i direction, okay? So now um, everything's happening just in the x direction. And if you see like in the y direction, it's just repeating the same thing. Nothing interesting happening. And in the z, it's just doing the same thing. It's all taking place. Next. It's a very much become a one-dimensional type of thing, right? And you end up taking the de derivative of this, and so you just get uh, one. And uh, you're taking the dot product, okay? So the vectors are, are going away, you're gonna get one. This change operator, which is the del operator, which is this upside down triangle, like that everywhere is functioning as a vector, okay? But if you go back in the beginning, it was a vector times a scalar field, so it turned it into a vector. Then it was a vector cross a vector, which is the curl. It, so vector cross vector gives you vector. Now here it's a vector dot vector. It gives you a scalar. Okay. So that was what I wanted to tell you so that you know as much as I know, and then you can laugh and see how I make all kinds of mistakes, but it's a learning process. And you can also see that, you know, John, who's just a, on a much higher level than me, uh, certainly in these subjects of multilinear calculus, of physics, uh, mathematical physics, of, of functional analysis, you see, to hang out with someone like that, hang out with me, right? And so if you want to have more of this, if you want to learn and you want to see how it connects to wisdom, please um, leave comments and encourage us. It will be encouraged. Now, back to the past. It's this double causality. John Harland is a functional analyst who is passionate about physics. Uh, he um, uh, teaches mathematics and statistics at Palomar College in California. Um, this video is for those who are already somewhat familiar, like me, <laughs> with uh, uh, gradient, curl, and divergence, but want to build up some intuition um, because... Uh, in a future video, um, John will be teaching us about how to calculate the anti-curl, uh, which is to say, if we know that the divergence of a vector field is zero, then can we represent that vector field as the curl of another vector field? And so, um, in this video, he'll lead us up to that. It'll be quite a walk, like a walk through the foothills uh, up to the base camp with those who are already ready for the climb to the big peak that will be the next video. And there's also another subject that uh, uh, keep in mind that I'm interested in because I'm developing uh, 
the relationship between mathematics and this language of wisdom of cognitive frameworks. And that is the connection between um, exact sequences and these cognitive frameworks are called divisions of everything. So in particular, uh, gradient, curl, divergence, form, uh, what is called an exact sequence. Those are three maps between vector spaces. Uh, and uh, they, um, uh, they um, are joined by two more maps, which are trivial for a total of five maps. So the idea is that those five maps express five perspectives um, in a cognitive framework I call the five sum for decision making, making in space or time, whereby every effect has had its cause, but not every cause has had its effects. And so there's a critical point for deciding. And so the question for me is how could that possibly line up? What intuition could we get from curl, uh, from gradient uh, curl divergence? Because uh, those are really key for physical understanding. You know, it's a by it's an interesting coincidence. And furthermore, there's a very famous uh, short exact sequence which has one map less. So if you think of that short exact sequence as relating a injection and a surjection. What this is doing is the curl is somehow separating those two and uh, navigating, uh, uh, negotiating their relationship. And that'll turn out to be a relationship between the local and the global, I suspect, because uh, in this video, you'll see our learning process, my learning process that I'll note, um, we'll talk about uh, rotations like of a paddle wheel and how those rotations could be like a global flow, like this paddle we could be flowing globally, but it could also be spinning locally. And then another connection I'll note is that uh, John will talk that in calculating the anti-curl, um, you can, uh, the answer you get is up to the addition of any possible uh, gradient, which is a huge uh, variety, kind of restricted, but still a huge choice. And see, these are, I note, uh, the possible physical environments, the possible physical potentials. So what the curl, the anti-curl seem to be doing is to teasing apart an object like us, you know, and the physical environment, which could be changing. Okay. So if uh, you're ready, uh, here's the show. Uh, John will teach us. Uh, please like, subscribe, and um, let's learn together. Welcome, John. Yeah, thank you, Anders. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. A little background here is that uh, I mean, maybe I should just talk about the Dell operator. It is really you can think of it as a vector operator, where these vectors are just partial derivatives. You know, vector uh, entries are partial derivatives with respect to x y and z so we have that um and uh we have this um we have gradient oh let's talk about a vector field or just a if you have a function say from um, R3 into R. You can talk about the gradient of the function. I mean, uh, should, I, should I be this basic, Anders? This is just the vector composed of three partial derivatives. So Anders, uh, it, is this, uh, once you unmute and let me know if if, yeah, if, everything is fine. Um, okay, so I should I should go now to this level of details, the gradient. Just to start, sure, like to define these things. Okay, and then uh, you know, the, so the three the three differential operators in multi dimensional calculus, the typical ones are gradient, uh, divergence, and so now I'm going to talk about a vector field, which goes from R three into R three. This is just a function, a scalar function.
And you can also have a vector value function or sometimes called a scalar field or a vector field. It's just basically an, a vector valued function. <laughs> but you can talk about the divergence, which is just del dot f. If you write f as its component functions f1, f2, f3, and del dot f is just the first, the x derivative of f1 plus the y derivative of f2 plus the z derivative of f3. Um, and curl is, you write it as del cross f, and it really is just, you can think of it as a cross product between this differential operator and this vector field So a way of organizing that, as with any curls, you could write it out this way, sorry. It's just the, der the determinant Given by here, where i, j, k are the are the um, unit vectors in the coordinate directions, and what this really is is this is just i times um, the y derivative of f three minus the z derivative of f two plus j is the z derivative of f1 minus the and i'm gonna you know conflate my notation here i want to use f1 to f2 f3 because it's just you know in del1 del2 del3 because it's just kind of cleaner mm -hmm. in the end um and plus k times let's see if one three three one so it's going to be um one two then two, three, two, one, rather. Let's see if and, I got that right. And so, uh, and then with your I could write. And then uh, I, just to say that uh, they look like uh, rotations to me, like around the I axis, you would be rotating in the uh, JK plane, right? Is that uh, basically like it has the form of a rotation? Is that right or not? Uh, it, kind of, it does it kind of look like a rotation. Um, it is related to rotation, and that um, what curl really is, um, you um, so curl is the direction of it, the direction of curl is the direction where you get the maximum The maximum um, magnitude you get out of a line integral around a closed curve. Mm -hmm. But then you have to normalize this. And so, you know, so suppose the curve has radius. Um, Epsilon, you have to normalize by the area inside that curve, which is going to be pi times epsilon squared. And you're going to take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the I think that's the direction is the maximum magnitude of that line integral. And um 
let's see, and then the magnitude of it is just the limit. So basically you're looking at where a vector field tends to curl around a particular direction. The direction of curl is where you get the maximum amount of curling around that direction. And, and the magnitude of the curl is the actual mm -hmm. you know, magnitude of the curl around that direction. So a vector field that doesn't curl at all, that doesn't tend to rotate at all, um, basically when you put like a little paddle wheel in the vector field and let that paddle mm -hmm. wheel flow with the vector field, if that paddle wheel does not rotate, if it just sort of flows without rotating, then the curl is zero. But if the paddle wheel tends to rotate, in other words, just kind of a shear on the paddle wheel, and it rotates as it flows with the with the vector field, then there's a non-trivial curl. Yeah, I was I was you know studying uh, this, and so I like the picture where like if you have water flowing, so like your vectors are waters, and so you have this paddle yeah. wheel, and then if right, it's right. stronger on one side than on the right. other side, then it'll lean on that side; it'll overcome the other side. That's right. So, yeah, your paddle wheel will tend to rotate and if it tends to rotate then that vector field has a curl right as it flows with the vector field so um and so there's some maybe, relation maybe maybe just to jump in uh, so the way you've given the formula what happens or what well what would happen if um there were two different axes in which you could have a maximum magnitude that must not be possible, right? Um, well, then, no, I think that's, that is possible. It's sort of like having a gradient that's, um, so let's think about. Um, because the, there needs to be a, the, there needs to be an axis that's well-defined, right? There does. Um, I mean, the curl could definitely be zero. Well, okay, so but in that case, it all collapses. But mm -hmm. but if it's non-zero, then it needs to have a preferred uh, axis, right? So in that case, I think you're I think you're right. There would be a preferred axis. Just like I'm thinking about gradient, is there always a preferred direction if you have a non-constant vector field? And I think that there is. Um, yeah, if the vector field is varying, there's going to be a definite direction to the gradient. You know, in other words, the steepest uphill um, incline of that of that. Um, and I was thinking, yeah. uh, I, I had this in, you know, I was kind of building intuition and preparing for this, but when you have a gradient, um, you can, you can trace out paths. And uh, my understanding is you shouldn't get any loops in a gradient. That's right. Well, you don't get a curl. So, so, I mean, some facts about this. But, but, but the idea is that like, you shouldn't get any loops because that would be a problem and so no potential, you know, if, if a gradient yeah, yeah. comes from that's potential, right. no potential can give you a loop. Um, that's one that's right. consequence. And then uh, with the um, curl, it's like, uh, well, the curls are give you loops. Like, you know, or they don't necessarily give you loops themselves. But like, if you add a constant field, let's say, you know, if you change the field, you'll get loops, I think, like that. So... Yeah, is that uh, is that basically I'm on am I on track or not? Uh, is if, that if your field comes from a gradient, then it's very restricted. It's it's curl has to be zero. So the curl, I'm sorry, of a gradient. Mm -hmm. Is that easy to prove? Or... Yeah, you just write it out. I mean, it's, yeah, you just write this out for a gradient where F1, F2, F3 come from a gradient of a function. And yeah, it's because of the commutivity of partial derivatives. Right, I think I saw that. Yeah, well, yeah you just, you sum everything up and everything cancels. Yeah, so it's it's just a just a direct computation. Mm -hmm. um, the curl, the gradient of a function is equal to zero. So that means if you start with a function and you go to its gradient, and then you take its curl. And, and and the point being is that when you write the gradient out, it has it gains an uh, 
a, der a partial derivative term. So you have a partial derivative in there. And then so that partial derivative will be commuting. Like, so one, yeah. you know, one delta uh, one will come from uh, the gradient and another will come from the curl operation and they'll be swapping delta two and delta one will swap and they'll, they'll cancel, give you zero. But that it's built into the gradient uh, because if it right. wasn't there, then you couldn't uh, necessarily conclude. That and, it would swap out. and you're absolutely right. Um, so that that you get a short exact sequence um, when you uh, give them by the gradient gradient in the curl. And um, you're right that that. Um, Gradients are very, you know, if you have a differentiable function and you take its gradient, it's a very restrictive vector field. In particular, It's curl is equal to zero. Mm -hmm. So if this is and equivalently, if you take around any closed loop, the line integral, you get zero. So um and that's equivalent because of Stokes' theorem, and um, but also from the definition of you know you can see it you know just embedded in the in sort of the definition of curl that that um, that uh, if the curl is zero that you know these had all all these had better be zero and vice versa so. Um, Okay, so that's that's one short exact sequence. Another short exact sequence is that if you take the divergence of the curl of any vector field, in other words, if you start with the vector field mm -hmm. and you take its curl first, and then take its divergence. You get zero. So in other words, this is a short exact sequence. And the, so just intuitively, you know, trying to understand this, like a kind of thought out that like in the case of the, uh, gradient, you're getting these deterministic lines and they can't get ever into loops. But when you're getting these like curls, you're basically having these loops, you know, where every each, each time you go around, you can be building up more and more and more, you know, you have to basically count how many times are you going around uh, and you'll, you'll get different answers. Uh, but in the case of divergence, it's like your lines or your vectors are accelerating or decelerating. Uh, so they're like sources or sinks. Um, right, right. So, you know, divergence. So is that on track? What I said greater than zero quite? means that you know you have a you have a source. Mm -hmm. You know, the lines on the average kind of point away from from a point at R. And they're growing. They're accelerating, basically. Like they're well, they're, they can. I mean, basically, they're they're emerging. You know, on the average from R in a positive way mm -hmm. uh, or diverges less than zero geometrically the intuition there is that the on the average the field lines are converging but, toward but, that. but i think there's a little bit more than that because uh, if they're not accelerating they're flat and then the derivatives are zero um from the point of view of divergence right like so then it, then it would just be divergence would be zero like they have to be growing, uh, you know, either in a negative direction or positive direction or whatever. Um, 
Mm. Is am I or am I wrong about that? So you're talking about a a, a, a smooth diversion, so a different, you know, not not like a, you know, like the typical physical model would you say a point charge. Let's say it's let's but, say it's but, smooth, right? Or okay, so if it's smooth, um, if you use like elect electrostatic example, I think you're right. Like if you have a um a charge, a, say a even a like a constant charge distribution, um. So, I mean, I have to think about this. The divergence of the electric field would be, um, would be say, some constant uh, row. And that means that the electric field itself would grow as you went outward from that point. Mm -hmm. Now, once you, once you reach the boundary of that charge distribution, the electric field would then start decaying. You know, according to sort of a, it, it, in a sense, like an inverse square law. And so, so the, you're, so you're the arrows right. are changing you're, sides, you're picking, right? You're right. picking up if the if 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 the divergence is truly positive throughout a full open set, like a, a region of space, then yes, the field is growing as you as you move move through that region, as you move from the center of that region outward toward the toward the boundary of that region. You're right; it it is picking up. Or, or, or it could be shrinking, let's say, but it has to be changing. Otherwise, it's zero, I think, right? Like, Well, yeah, at some point, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, once you get outside, say, a charge distribution, suppose that, mm -hmm. you know, it's just sort of a, uh, a uniform charge distribution, you know, in a, uh, say, a, a spherical ball. Once you get outside of it, the divergence is now zero out here. Well, I guess I'm I may be misunderstanding in the sense I'm just looking at like divergence is going from the vector three dimensional vector space to a scalar field, right? It's giving you a number. It's giving you a scalar. So it's not giving you vectors, basically. Right. Oh, but what it is doing, though, it is taking vectors as input. And so then that goes back to my point, like. Uh, if those vectors at input were all the same size, right? Like then, um, well, I guess they could be changing direction. I guess that's well, the certainly thing. your field is not constant. That you know, if your field was constant, divergence would be zero, gradient would be zero, curl would be zero. But they could um, be changing directions, right? Like they could be. Uh, oh well, then they're yeah, if they're changing direction. Then definitely they're not they're not constant fields if they have the same magnitude that are changing direction they are not constant just like just like if you're traveling at uniform motion mm -hmm. uh in terms of velocity uh, in terms of speed but you change direction you know there is an acceleration there um so yeah you would get non-zero partial derivatives if the field direction was changing as you were moving around but not its magnitude but would you get like, but I think like if you had a rotation, for example, right, like a constant rotation, divergence would be zero, right? So you're talking about a vector field that, that, um, is circular, like, you know, you're, you have arrows going around in, a... okay. So, so for example, mm -hmm. yes, that is true. Like, so, so the archetypical vector field that circulates is, uh, for example, um, uh, negative x times uh, j. I'm sorry. Negative y times j times i, rather. Mm -hmm. Plus x times j. So, and, and then plus zero times k. So what vector field, What what does that look like? Mm -hmm. Basically, it's a vector field that. Um, yeah, it has no z component. It's in the plane, or it's so it's a vector field that at every you know at every point you know, um, in a plane parallel to the x y plane, it circulates around the z axis. I mean, mm -hmm. at, at every plane that's. Um, so let me see if I can make that a little more vivid. Well, maybe I can say it in another way. Like, 
the divergence is summing up all these things in the different directions with regards to uh, the changes in the different directions. And if the sum of the changes is zero, then from the divergence point of view, like there was no real change. Uh, so these rotations and things like that, they all sum up to be, um, the idea is that they're summing up to be zero. Uh, so they're not constituting a real change. But if, uh, so for there to be a real change, something has to be changing like in the overall length of the, the vectors. You know, as you're going through this vector space, there's got to be these jolts and jerks and, you know, and uh, accelerations and whatever. Um, otherwise, if it's just, um, there won't be any sources or sinks without these jerks and does that well, I... yeah i mean there have, there have to be so so it's true that for this vector field which is sort of the archetypical vector field with a constant curl the curl of this is equal to just k just one mm -hmm. times k. so it's going in the you know it's a vector field that's um circulating in the right hand sense oh, okay the k mm -hmm. axis right And um, oh, and so, it's constant. Uh, it's, I see. It's it curls a constant. It, it's got a constant curl, but it's got a zero divergence because okay. you know uh, the f sub one is just y, so its x derivative is zero, and f sub two is I'm sorry, f sub one is negative y, f sub two is x, oh, right, and f sub three is. Is it's zero. zero in each direction. I mean, in the sense that, like, uh, it's it's never going uh, in the direction of the derivative. It's never moving. It's always orthogonal right. to it. That's right. That's right. In the direction of the derivative, it has. It's not picking up any. Okay, any... and so that goes back to what I was saying. Like, in the direction of the derivative, it needs to be changing um, what it's doing. So that's to right. Start. That's right. And so it needs to be doing these accelerations or decelerations or something like that. Uh, I think you're right. Yeah, that is a way of thinking about it. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Trying to you know, make yeah, sense. It's got to be picking up magnitude in the direction, in 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 the direction of the derivative. Yeah, got to be picking up magnitude in that direction. Um, so here this doesn't pick up any magnitude in the direction. Like if you go in the x, let's see. Basically, if you go in the radial direction, there's no change at all. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, that's not true, actually. If you, I mean, it does pick up. What am I? What am I trying to say? If you go in the x direction, um, basically, it's pointing in the. If you go in the i direction, um, this thing, this vector field, is pointing you know if you go out in the i direction the vector field is pointing in the j direction if you go mm -hmm. in input if you go in the i direction the output is pointing in the j direction so there you you are not picking up any steam in the um, direction of the differentiation in the, in the direction of the differentiation yeah that's a helpful example so um so but i mean the vector field is getting larger in magnitude as you as you go out in the but not i direction well so but not not all the man all the magnitude is picking up in the j direction not in the i direction right right and also i i'm guessing but maybe i'm wrong but if you look at the overall magnitude right that's probably not changing either if the overall magnitude was changing then in no, some the component magnitude. you would have acceleration no the overall magnitude is changing um not in this example right well, yeah. Now, if you if you increase if you increase um, x, this expression gets larger in magnitude. I mean, the the vector field does get larger in magnitude. It's just in, it get it picks up steam in the j direction, not the i direction. Okay. Okay. So then I'm wrong about that. Okay. So you've yeah. clarified that. So that's yeah. uh, that that fixes what I was. Yeah. Right. It's kind of like if you're going in a particular direction, are you are you are you picking up commensurate magnitude in that direction? I think that's what divergence is is telling us. 
if that is the case. Basically, the lines, there is some, you know, if there was a divergence, a non-trivial divergence here, let's say the origin, there would be some average pointing away from the origin in the vector field. And there's none at all. Mm -hmm. All the vector field, if you move out, it's, you know, the radial line, if you, if you move, the vector field is always perpendicular to radial lines. Mm -hmm. And so that's the situation where when you put a paddle wheel, like in the origin, it would just rotate, mm -hmm. it wouldn't flow anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but in fact, if you put a paddle wheel anywhere in there, it would flow around the, it would flow around the K axis, but it would also rotate it was, as it was doing so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there's some normalization I think you can divide by maybe um, if you take F, I forget how this works. If you take F over R, I believe the curl is zero or R squared. There's some scaling. Yeah, I mean, there there's some normalization you could do on this particular vector field, I think, to get zero curl. Um, and I never quite understood. <laughs> it's almost like you're, 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 um, you're sort of killing the centrifugal part of it mm -hmm. if you if you divide by the right power of r, mm -hmm. and the, the basically the shear aspect of it. Um, so in the, in that case, I guess the paddle wheel would go around, still go around, but it just wouldn't rotate. Um, it would just sort of go around in parallel. Um, what does that okay. mean? It would go around in parallel. Well, it would just like the paddle wheel would be, you know, if you divided by and and we'd have to work this out. I mean, we should we could we could work out this example if you want. No, that's but could, fine. But 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 but, it, but if you divide by the right thing, what happen what would happen is if you put a paddle wheel out here, you know, just a paddle wheel, it would go around, but I don't think it would rotate. It would tend not to in other words Oh, it would just be moved around, but it would not rotate locally. It would right. rotate it would not globally. Rotate around it, it ro rotate around its own axis. <laughs> so it is long. It, so basically, you have to. That's interesting. So that yeah, and that's the kind of thing. Maybe just to say, like you know, just to jump ahead to this uh, short exact. I mean, this uh, exact sequence situation. I'm looking at how does curl uh, bridge. Um, the gradient uh, injectiveness and the divergences subject uh, surjectiveness, and it bridges, and it somehow has to cut the world in half, in a so to speak. But I'm just looking at this global and local difference. You know, you have global rotational behavior uh, where it's uh, you know the paddle wheel is floating around, right? But you also have this uh, local behavior where it's spinning around, right? Yeah. And that seems like a very nice. Place, there could be this distinction of behavior, you know, yeah. cutting it in half, dividing it into two, you know, in a global and a local sense. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, or? I sort of see your point. I, I'm just, you know, it's. We'll get, we'll get to that, but, but. Um... So, so okay. Um, I mean, we're not, we're not <laughs> making very rapid progress here, but it's, you know, it's good to flush these things out. I mean, it, it's mm -hmm. these are. I mean, these have higher dimensional analogs and differential geometry, and and you know, there's some very interesting geometry I think that that comes out of it, uh, even in three dimensions. I, I'm this is helping my me a lot in mm -hmm. building my intuition and so okay, appreciate that. All right, good. Okay, so as long as it's useful for you, that's that's good. I mean, um, I I want to go back. Uh, you know, this fact that I just told you, if you divide by the right power of R, mm -hmm. um, the curl would be zero. But I, I'm i now sort of doubting myself because I'm I'm seeing that completely from memory. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't have that computation in my head right now. Um, and so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to verify that. Uh, so I like this example of, of, of curl, like this, a very simple example of a, of a, uh, vector field that has a constant curl so and it's very intuitive and easy to understand um so 
But what is interesting about all this stuff is that you can reverse this. In other words, um, note, you know, the curl of a gradient of a function is equal to zero. So if the curl is equal to zero, say curl of a, a vector field G is equal to zero, is G the gradient of another vector field? In other words, can you reverse this? Which is the subject of your presentation. Right. This was all so, preliminary, for, so I would if understand. If curl G is equal to zero, does that imply G is equal to the gradient of a scalar field F? And the answer is yes, sort of. I see up to a constant vector field. And, and mm -hmm. so, and, and why? Because you can take, you know, if you want to go from, say, some R naught to R through some path, um, you can always integrate along that path. You can integrate the original vector field G along that path. and come up with a function of R. So this is a path integral. So you have some R naught and you have an R and you can take any path you want from R and I should really write this, you know, in path integral form. So you're going from R naught to R along any path you want, and you'll get a scalar number out of this path integral, but it turns out this is path independent. In other words, it only depends on R and R naught and not the inter intervening path. And the reason why is because the curl is equal to zero, so that says that the integral by Stokes theorem is integral around any closed path is equal to zero. So that means that if you take any two paths connecting R naught and R, the line integral on those two paths is going to be equal because if you go one path followed by the opposite of the other path, you're going to get zero. Oh, you know, this is so topological, you yeah. know, in terms of like, um, this really resonates with algebraic topology that I've been studying. And so to go back to the gradient, like when I was saying there's these deterministic lines, it's kind of like saying like there's a path, you know? So what a gradient means is it means that there's paths and those paths don't have loops, so to speak. They just go direct um, uh, somehow. But here you can have uh, loops, but like you're saying, like when you integrate across uh, a path integral, it doesn't matter what path you take, you're going to get the same. And that's because, um, I guess here it's because the curl is zero. Is that right? Or That's right. But if the curl was not zero, the path would matter. Is that right or not? That's uh, right. Okay. That's right. Because you could see that, you know, for example, this is not the gradient of any vector field because when you take the uh, path integral around, say, this path here, mm -hmm. it's just going to be, you know, it's going to pick up steam you know, everywhere mm -hmm. you're at, and you're going to get some non-zero number if you're going around a loop around the, mm -hmm. the k-axis in a, in a plane parallel to the xy, you know, the ik plane. So, but if you go back, if you go backwards, uh, then you, go you backwards, will get the opposite. Or, well, if you insist that your curl is equal to zero, then everything is fine in terms of. No, but in in the, in the example of the rotation, you're uh, saying it depends on the path, right? So, well, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, definitely. There's paths. Yeah, so if you take a path 
I believe you took a path out here that does not include the k-axis. The would the integral around it be zero? I'm not sure. Um, uh, let's see. Well, you were you were talking about different. No, no one. No, no. It would be because you have a constant curl. Um, no, this is it, an example with constant curl, right? So yeah. But if you take a if you take a if you take a path, say that is parallel to the uh k i plane you know a path that is vertical like that and mm -hmm. say perpendicular to j i believe that uh i believe the integral around that would be zero because perpendicular to the vector field at every point I, I'm sorry, so, I missed. Are you talking about this example or another example? Yeah, this 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 example right here. I mean, there's some paths, some closed paths you can you can integrate around to get something zero. But if you if you um, if you integrate in a oh in, in a, a vertical a horizontal way, plane right. horizontal plane, you're going to get something non-zero. Okay. Okay. So. Um, so that's that. That's you know, it's an easy solution to the anti gradient. Mm -hmm. So this is our anti gradient. Oh, this is the anti gradient. I see. So that's how you compute an anti gradient. Mm -hmm. And in particular, this. It's a straightforward computation to show that this satisfies the gradient of f is equal to g. So now the thing is you can add any constant vector field mm -hmm. um, to this and you'll still get the same gradient. So really, if you know what the vector field is at one point, mm -hmm. r not, then you can integrate from there to get the vector field at any other point. Okay. Okay. So, but you do have to know what it is. Um, so this um, determines the anti-gradient up to uh, whatever the value at So it determines the anti-gradient up to whatever value you want the function to be at at, at a given point in space. And, but up what, to the... what, and what are your assumptions about the functions that you've been working oh, on? Oh, the function, uh, probably continuously differentiable. Okay. Um, yeah. So all functions here. You could probably relax some of those those assumptions. You know, if you really, if your analysis, your situation in hand, mm -hmm. you know, required required to consider more general functions. But you know, we're just trying to get a gestalt here, just to sure. You know, so assume whatever whatever regularity we want. Okay, so okay, so let's note that the divergence of a curl is equal to zero. So can we um, can we re reverse this logic? I.e. Does the divergence of, say, a vector field equal to zero imply that this vector field is equal to the curl of another vector field. Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes. Sort of. In the sense that
since uh, the curl of a gradient is always equal to zero, our anti-curl will only be determined up to a gradient. So that's a pretty big, um, you know, large dimensional set of solutions for anti-curl. You can just add the gradient of any function, you still get an anti-curl. Oh, so maybe to let me think about that. So you're saying that, so in the other case, it was up to a constant vector field, but in this case, it's more uh, sophisticated. It's saying your anti-curl will only be determined up to a gradient F, for any, it could be any gradient, like you were saying, yeah. right? Like it could be any yeah. gradient. Now, on the other hand, you said that gradients are extremely restrictive. So they um, are, but there's still an infinite dimensional uh, space okay, of right. gradients. Where really, this was only a three dimensional space of possible um, mm -hmm. redundancy here. It's a three dimensional, you know, you just uh, choose. Well, it's really just a, I mean, it's no, it's a one dimensional. It's just one real dimension, right? So this the, the real dimension is um, which is the real dimension? It's uh... well, there, so so an anti an anti gradient is determined up to one real dimension. The real dimension. Oh right, you said like a constant vector field. Uh, right. So it would be yeah. Just well, one, well, 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 well. Let's see. Is it well? True? No, it's a constant function. It's a constant function. So it's just one number. There's one number. Um, so basically, the set of redundancy is in one to one correspondence with a set of real numbers. That's a one dimensional set. Oh, of, it's so. up to. A, it's not up to a constant vector field. It's oh, oh well, but that's what you F wrote. F or is, F is a scalar. F is a scalar function, not a not a vector function. Oh, so what, should it be up to a constant scalar field? What you're writing, or up? Yes, yeah, so, well, no, it's up to a constant scalar. You know that scalar, whatever the whatever the value at a particular um, R naught is. But it's just so is that incorrect? What you wrote, just to kind of badger you a little bit further up, where you say it's yes, sort of up to a constant vector field. Write that that's line wrong. right there. That's wrong. Um, Maybe fix that. Yeah. Up to a constant number. Okay. Scalar. That's good Thanks. that we fixed that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, in terms of anti curl, we can't hope to get any sharper than this because you can add the gradient of any, um, of any, uh, function, you know, real valued function and still get the same curl in other words uh, because and the... so and so what this brings to mind for me is like when you say a gradient of function that function is like a potential i would imagine that's and, right and so what this is saying it's saying like your uh anti-curl will only be determined up to any potential so this anti-curl is kind of like um has a life of its own and you can put it in any physical world, so to speak, right? Like, you know, there's this interesting dichotomy, like where, you know, that anti-curl is like a human being or a brick or anything, but you can take that brick and put it on the moon. You could put it on the, you know, in the middle of the sun, you could put it yeah. um, any physical yeah. situation, you know, any potential you could put it in. Right. And so that's very interesting for me. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing is, how do you write the anti-curl? You know, and that's what I, that's kind of what I, I challenged myself to do. It, you know, give myself a little homework problem. Mm -hmm. And it turns out it's, it's a pretty interesting, you know, it gets into some pretty interesting stuff, including the top topology of the, of the um, set that you're trying to write the anti-curl over mm -hmm. and boundary values and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, and I, I still don't quite understand the full picture, but, um, one of the things that um, 
you know, one of the ways of breaking this down is, can you write it locally? In other words, can you, you know, in a, in a small open set, can you find a function whose curl is a given vector field if that vector field has zero divergence? So you have to assume that the vector field has zero divergence if you expect to have an anti-curl. Otherwise, uh, there's no hope at all because um, if there was an anti-curl F, that G was equal to, you know, G was equal to the curl of, then the divergence of G would be zero because the divergence of a curl is zero. So you have to assume at the minimum that your divergence is zero. By the way, the you, you assume and you and you know it, right? Like because it yeah, you're like in the case of electricity and magnetism, that's just one of the law of Maxwell's equations, right? The mm -hmm. the curl of a of the magnetic induction B is equal to zero. And that's just a law of nature. Um, mm -hmm. Those of you, for example, there's no mo magnetic monopoles, at least classically. Mm -hmm. But um, so th then the question is, 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 is B, you know, the magnetic induction field, you know, the magnetic induction, the curl of anything. And it is, it's the curl, the vector potential A, mm -hmm. but the vector potential is only determined up to a gradient. Mm -hmm. So that's where ga gauge theory comes in, is that you can you can write that, you know, you can make mm. various assumptions about the 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 vector potential A. And you what are the different gauges that the Lorentz gauge, there's different there's different conventions for um for what gradient you're gonna add to it, because you can add any gradient and you'll still get the same physics. It's just that the mathematics may look different. And then the quantum mechanics, of course, is different when you add different gauges. Um, and so and so this is this notion of um, having freedom, right? Like, you know, that there's a, you know, that you could actually measure the kind of freedom that you have. Um, it's the yeah. freedom of having, you know, determined up to potential. And this really, um, uh, just to foreshadow where I want to take it with this exact sequence analysis, but... Uh, um, in this uh, exact sequence, um, which is longer than a short exact sequence, you know, the typical short exact sequence would be uh, zero goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to zero. And then this adds another element. And so this one would be what I think is like the five sum, you know, like there's five different uh, maps involved uh, in that. And, and so those five different maps like have a, you know, they have cognitive, they're kind of carving up the cognitive space. But what they do it is for decision making, like in space and time. And you can really see this creeping up with the curl where curl is making physics possible, you know, in the sense that curl is saying that you can have a potential and you can have a object and they can be um, teased apart, which is a very um, remarkable thing, you know, which is makes the whole, you know, it's such an everyday type of thing. But, you know, if, 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 but it's very uh, unclear. Like, how can you tease apart an object and take it, you know, move it from one environment to another environment and so on, right? Like, but this is exactly what it's saying. Uh, that yeah, uh, that mean, you can it, tease out a subsystem from a system. Hmm. Right? I mean, like, that's because the, 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 the system is the potential, you know, that the system yeah. has a potential, but... Within that potential, you just, you know, this is saying you can subtract out the potential. The potential is not really relevant for the subsystem. Yeah, yeah. For, yeah, for example, in the magnetic field. Um, so, uh, anywho, um, so let's let's just write down a primitive anti-curl mm -hmm. because, you know, it, it, this is quite a bit more involved than, than, writing down an anti-gradient. An anti-gradient is a simple object. Mm -hmm. um, the anti-gradient is just gotten by just taking a line integral. Mm -hmm. So rather r relatively simple in the in the world of vector calculus. Anti-curl, on the other hand, we don't expect it to be so simple. For one thing, there's an infinite dimensional set of them. And then there's going to be boundary issues. Um, and so the first thing we're going to do is assume something um, utterly simple about our vector field. Um, we're not only going to assume that the gradient is equal to zero, but we're going to assume that to begin with, it, it vanishes at infinity. Um, so 
to get at least an expression for a local anti-curl. Now, um, what I mean by local anti-curl is that in a small open set, for example, we, our, our overall set may be some big blob in space, but we're really only interested to begin with in getting an anti-curl in some small open set of that. And then, uh, then we'll we'll expand our expand our scope to to other to other situations. But if we can get an anti curl in some open set, at least it's a baseline that allows us to consider like more complicated examples. The way to do that, you know, this the way to approach any kind of local problem is just to assume that things vanish at infinity. In other words, you're already in your little local set. In other mm -hmm. words, you're not looking at the boundary at all. You're not looking at the large scale behavior of the function. You just want to know what happens in some small set. So the first assumption, simplifying assumption. Is that G vanishes at infinity. i.e. g of x, y, z goes to zero if x or y or z go to infinity. Mm -hmm. If any of these, if any coordinate gets large, then this function gets small. Another simplifying assumption um, or whatever it has to be. C is it's it's either single differentiable or twice differential, probably continuously differentiable is fine. Also, G is integrable, so it's in L1. So we're assuming that G is in L1, I think C1 would be fine enough, continuously differentiable, but it also vanishes at infinity. So that's a shorthand way of writing that. And if we need to make more assumptions, for example, um, you know, it doesn't even matter to me if we assume that G is a Schwartz function. I just want a formula for an anti-curl and mm -hmm. that, that'll, that'll generalize to more, more exotic examples. Um, okay, so... Um, I'm sorry. So what is L prime? L prime is a L L1. That's oh, L1. L1. I see. That means it's uh, integrable. Is that right? Or... Yeah. Okay. It means the absolutely integrable. Okay. Which means it has to go down at infinity, like what you're saying, uh, down right. to zero. Well, no, no, it doesn't. Um, you know what? That probably is. That probably is true. Yeah, L1 functions do have to, um, oh, you know, it's like they can have little blips that, that keep I see, on they could have, they could, they, could, they could not, I mean, but they would have to keep shrinking in area, the area. Spike up. Yeah. They could sw spike up on just sets of smaller and smaller measure, right? Just, uh, you know, the width of the spikes has to get smaller and smaller. Okay, but in principle, the, so not the, but the area goes down to... Um, yeah, the I mean, total, by being integral, that's what it means. Yeah, so the, the area on yeah, the extremes so, has so to it's go like, to zero. You know, it gives less value. But, but I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to vanish in infinity so that we can, right. we don't have to worry about that. Uh, we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus and, okay, and, you know. Oh, I it. see. This is where you put make it continuous. So uh, and and do and con, and differentiable, right? Yeah, because we're gonna we're gonna want to we're gonna want to differentiate across integrals and all that kind of stuff. I'm so just catching we, up. This is this is trivial for you. You're an analyst and a. And so I'm just catching up with you. Okay. Yeah. I see. So I mean, the point you're is putting that, these that, conditions that, on. You're formalizing them. Yeah. I am kind of formalizing them, but I'm I'm saying also or whatever, uh, saying whatever sure. regularity we need to assume. You know, so I could have just said everything's a Schwartz function. Then, it, then, then there would have been would have been infinitely differentiable and gone oh, to infinity super fast, um, faster than any polynomial. Uh, mm -hmm. and that would that would you know that's that's a subset of any conceivable function space that you can right. think of. The short space is sort of the nicest function space, although it's not analytic. Um, so 
maybe analytic Schwartz functions are even nicer. Um, so, okay, so where are we going from this? Oh yeah, so here, what's the anti-curl? And this is the climax of the whole. Yeah, I mean, it, it took me quite a few hours to figure this out. So I'm, I'm a little embarrassed about how long it took me to, to, to come around to this, but it, it, uh, it was really fun. You know, I just, <laughs> it's like, I just entertained myself by doing this and it really would have been much more efficient just going and looking it up. Every so often I get like a bee in my bonnet where I want to just do something, you know, I don't want to look mm -hmm. it up. I just want to do it. And it's, it actually, I, I, I don't, you know, to make progress in my large scale problems, it's really not a good instinct. You know, I have to admit it's an indulgence. Um, so everything that you're about to see is an indulgence, but it, on the other hand, you know, I am a mathematician and I do want to use my bare hands sometimes. And so I think it's okay to indulge every so often. And, and, and you actually learn, you learn something when you do it. I it would have been, you know, all this stuff is, has been known for 200 years at least, you know, so it's, all, and, and it's I, I just, I'm very privileged, like to see you do this. I'm privileged to see that experience. And that's why uh, we're recording this for math for wisdom, because um, to see what you gain by seeing someone so advanced uh, going through the learning process. Uh, and yeah. we were talking about like Lee theory and Lee and Cartan and all these people that they went through the mechanics of it, you know, in ways that we don't see apparent uh, now that it's all made so abstract and so. Uh, right, right, yeah. Because a drag, drag, drag a learner through all that takes a huge amount of time. So you mm -hmm. know, you want to, you're always just sort of spoon feeding learners. You know, the most, you know, the most summary. And you're trying to make it tidy, like, you know, so you're showing the intuition, right? But you're not worrying yeah. about like exactly like how to make this as general as possible or how to yeah, make it as rigorous yeah. as possible. Right. And, and you'll see, you'll see at the end, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to really solve the general problem mm -hmm. because there's boundary, there's a boundary value problem. You know, mm -hmm. you have to, mm -hmm. solve to solve the general problem, but we'll lead up to that anyway. Um, so um, let's, let me just, just sort of, um, get to the point here and then i think i'll have to i i think i have to leave for the day we can always continue this recording if you want sure to. we can continue yeah. right okay so um so let's do a formula for the anti-curl this is the fun part and so what i'm going to do is i'm going to define some new operators which uh operate on uh l1 c1 or whatever However, regular it has to be into the real numbers. So this is integral one operates on a function. Uh, and what that means at x, y, z, it's the integral of uh, from negative infinity to x of f of t, y, z, dt. So you're integrating through the x variable. And you can see why I wanted things to vanish at negative infinity. So oh, I have I a see. reference mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you can imagine f x2, you know, integral 2, you just do it in the y variable. And what's the d um, that you, on the left-hand side, what would be integral over d sub what? Oh, I'm not, uh, this just notate, this just, this this is just. Um, so that d sub 1, or so like, I'm, so I'm 1 would be dx or d? So I'm defining operators, uh, integral 1, integral 2, and integral 3, I should say. Um, but but just because uh, so, just, so you know, I just want to write those I so I want to be able to write those symbols and have meaning. oh these are just names of symbols I see symbols this is just symbolism symbols. right it's yeah, the it's thing symbols. on the right hand the the left hand side is a symbol and the right hand side is the meaning I see right right okay that's right now I got it sorry I should have I should have no that's fine that's that. my okay, it's so I'm my... defining operators uh 
integral one, integral two, and integral three by these formulas. Right. So you can imagine what this one's going to be. You're going to integrate through the second variable. Right. And just for posterity, I'll write it out for the third integral. These are partial integrals. Mm -hmm. And that means that they go up to, well, what does it mean to be a partial integral? You're only integrating only over one of the variables. Okay. You're treating the others like they were constant, basically. We are. Yeah. And so, you know, the nice thing is um, that, no, this is kind of fun, um, that uh, if you take the derivative of the partial integral, mm -hmm. this is equal to the identity. In other words, you take, say, the derivative, the x derivative of mm -hmm. this partial integral from negative infinity to infinite to x of f of t, y, z, dt. This is equal to just f of x, y, z. And so you're holding, when you do this, you're holding y and z constant. That's right. And so the only thing that is changing is the x. And um, and so, so y and z just become constants. And so you have a function on the left-hand side, you're, you're doing the partial derivative of a function in x. And so that was, uh, that was the result of an integral of you know and these y and z's are just constants and so then you just get back what you had it, so it's kind of like you can just erase the y and z almost and uh, then you would just get the yeah so this is just the fundamental theorem of calculus okay you're right if you hold y and z constant you get a, you you just get a function of of the first variable and so for every single um conceivable mm -hmm. pair of values for y and z you get you get the fundamental theorem of calculus applying mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay hanging in there with you thanks <laughs> okay. okay all right okay so so similarly d2 uh del2 is the this is These are opposite operators, and so are the partial derivative and partial integral. Mm -hmm. But moreover, you can also reverse the order. And this is what's key here. That if you first differentiate and then take the partial integral, this is mm -hmm. equal to the identity. Just as an aside, like uh, this brings to mind these raising and lowering operators in a certain sense uh, yeah. that we talked about, like in the Schrodinger well, equation video. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's somewhat, it, yeah, they're somewhat related because, I mean, for polynomials, you know, the differentiation and integration are raising and lowering operators. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's just that raising and lower oper operators are, you know, there's a, are, are a more, more general type for other other you know polynomial setups your shepherd polynomials right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so no, i assume that's a that that's a kind of an analogy there anyway now this is the identity too and and so why is this this is really kind of a key issue this becomes a, a bit more subtle you know why can you change the order of these two um well let's see uh if you just take you know this operator on a function and ask what is its value at x y z this is going to be so i'm going to operate that operator so that means the integral from negative infinity to x of the first derivative or the uh, the x partial t y z dt 
by the fundamental theorem of calculus, this is just going to be equal to f at x, y, z minus f at negative infinity, y, z. Now, of course, this is an improper integral. I should write this as a limit. So if you, so let me just patch this up and I'll write it in correct form here. So that's all for today from uh, John, uh, because uh, we're going to start new with a future video where he'll really do this calculation in the complete uh, sense. And there won't be any foothills to climb because we're ready now. With this, uh, we'll be joining the more experienced people who already know all this. If you'd like to learn more about uh, 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 gradient uh, curl divergence and uh, you didn't understand everything here, you know, leave questions, leave comments, uh, connect us because we could do videos to help you learn, you know, get started uh, if you want to walk on this journey between uh, math and wisdom. And so uh, my name is Andrus Kulikowskas. This is Math for Wisdom. Please like, subscribe and uh, support me through Patreon. I appreciate that. Thank you to all my supporters. Um, see you soon.